welcome to the Christmas podcast for Geeks of the Roundtable. Um, this is Geek Source Mike. With me today is the Sofa Reviews, Matt. Hello. Now another reviewer, Tim Bauer. Hello. And General Zilla. Hello, hello. Sorry, Matt, I forgot your last name for a second there. As in, you forgot my last name? Yes. But brought it up during Zilla's introduction. I don't think these things through, I just open my mouth and things happen. Rolling start, let's go. (laughs) And as it is the holiday season, we are going to be talking about Christmas today, or Hanukkah, or Kwanzaa, or Festivus, or Saturnalia, or whatever time of uh, winter solstice celebration you choose. Um, But we're just going to talk about, you know, let me briefly go over what we're doing this year, and anything we might have gotten for Christmas in the past that we feel has had a deep impact on our lives um, at this point. Um, so would anyone like to start? I guess I'll start. It wasn't so much a video game that I got for Christmas, but it was a video game that my mother got for Christmas, and um, it's a game that I, I play to this day. Uh, the first Final Fantasy she got when I was a kid... Uh, I can't tell you what age exactly, like five or six or something. And she put it in that morning and started playing it, and I saw it, and that started a thing. Uh, I actually remember vaguely, um, you know how uh, the characters would kneel whenever they're badly hurt? Yeah. Well, when I was a kid, I got a, a, a handheld video game that Christmas. Not a Tiger game, obviously, because, you know cheaper game handheld games at the time but uh that was like kind of the gag in my in my uh in my family for a little while after that christmas where if they were wounded and they were like kneeling down like that they were playing a handheld game so when they were beaten up they'd just start playing tetris yeah <laughs> yes yes that's what would happen just fuck this noise i'm gonna ignore you for now <laughs> That was the character speaking to the enemy, not me speaking to you. I needed that clarification, yeah. Well, when I was eight, I got... um, Up until that point, I had never owned a Game Boy. In fact, the only system we had ever owned was a Super Nintendo. Uh, But I continually watched my cousin, uh, Dan, and my friend Jake play this really fun-looking game called Pokemon. And uh, I guess... By the time Christmas in 1998, I had worn someone in my family down enough that they got my brother and I uh, Game Boy and Pokemon Red and Blue. And you know, if you go on my channel, you'll see I'm doing an entire series on Pokemon now. So you could make the argument that that's had an impact. What did it for me was uh, it was one Christmas, I think I was six or seven, when uh, I got my very first Game Boy in. Up until that point, I'd really just played uh, the NES at my grandma- at my grandparents' house. So this Game Boy was the first system I actually owned and had to myself. And it came with uh, Link's Awakening. And I, j- I played the crap out of that, and I, j- I never stopped until my very next game, which was, uh, which was Pokemon Red. And I mean, it was just all... It was just all uphill from there. Started getting into gaming. It, that's, that's really what set me off. For me, it was um, like Christmas 1993, I think, maybe 92. Um, I got a Sega Master System with Sonic 1 built in. And that was my first console and first game. Uh, I got that alongside a TV for my room as well. And, yeah, it literally set me off for gaming from that point on. Uh, since then, Christmas has always been uh, kind of the biggest gaming day for me. As it's a Tarakuna of Time, Shenmue, the Dreamcast itself... Uh, and so many others, the 360 at one point as well. Well, up until I was about, I don't know, probably 15, 14 or 15, the only RPGs, or JRPGs I had played were uh, Final Fantasy X, and if you counted Pokemon as an RPG, then that. Oh, abs- <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah, it's it's got enough of the same aspects that you could you could definitely make a solid argument that it's a JRPG, but... Um, for Christmas when I was 14 or 15, I got Final Fantasy X-2. <laughs> and that had the impact of teaching me that JRPGs can suck. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I played about 20 minutes of it on Christmas morning and got through the uh, what can I do for you cutscene and just turned off the PS2 and looked dejectedly at the floor at what my life had become. I do that about 20 minutes into any game that I've played lately, which is sad. Yeah, they've probably been, I've gotten a lot of RPGs at Christmas actually. Um it always sucks when you get a bad one. Or just a boring one. I had um I had uh, Mega Man Battle Network for one Christmas, which I really enjoyed. But then I got uh the sequel for the next Christmas and I I think I had just had enough of it at that point that I just didn't continue after about three hours. Well, in kind of the way that getting games from, from family members for Christmas, especially if they're like older family members, is that you'll you'll more often than not get a game that's kind of boring or just not very good. I mean, don't get me wrong, I appreciate everything that like my grandparents get me for Christmas and birthdays, and it, I, I love that they're, they're thinking of me, but... Uh, the first PS2 game I ever had from them was a game called Surfing H3O, and um, it just wasn't wasn't very good at all. H3O? What is that? I guess it was like the third game in the Surfing series or something. I imagine it's highly unstable. I imagine you would not want to surf on it or immerse your body in it. Like in the game, were you surfing in water? Yes. The, I guess the H3O was just supposed to be clever, though, like, trihydrogen monoxide would... I have no idea what that would be. It's not clever. No. Was this the 90s? It was, uh, I think it was the year 2000. Close enough. It's like, just on the cusp of the extreme without an E. We want to make water more extreme. Let's add a 3 instead of a 2. I just add sharks. That tends to make almost any situation more intense. Not deserts so much. That's probably the best place to encounter a shark. Yeah, there was... One of the Jaws movies they had... Like, they were studying the giant white shark in a tank, and one of the big questions was, well, why would you have this tank out in the middle of the ocean? Why wouldn't you build this facility in the desert so that if it breaks out, as it inevitably will, it's not as much of a problem? Because then there isn't a movie. We can't do science in the desert. I always find that kind of the interesting thing, like, because then there isn't a movie. Sometimes maybe that's the best option. Stupidity triggers plots. <laughs> so if you take away anything from this podcast, kids, remember, sometimes you should just do stupid things because it triggers the plot. Dun, 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 dun. That's pretty much the crux of Sierra Games. You say crux, but I love that about Sierra Games. I will admit I've played, like, two... And one of them was Leisure Suit Larry, so... And recently, I might add. King's Quest V, baby, kill the Yeti with a custard pie. Yeah, I'm glad I get to live through those games via Danny Sex Bang. And don't forget Ross. We could never forget about Ross, no matter how hard we tried. They, uh, they talked about how, like, horribly sad a sad Ross is. And yeah, for truth, there was there was a sad Ross a couple of times, and just so heartbreaking. Ross kind of seems like the epitome of a human puppy sometimes, and that he can be really annoying, or he can be really depressing when he's sad, or just... I have nowhere else to go with this analogy. <laughs> he has a tail. So, so we hear, heard it here, Mike doesn't really like Ross. Or puppies. <laughs> That's exactly what you should take from that conversation. <laughs> so, uh, since we're talking about it, what is uh, what does everybody think is of Susie as a grump? She's fine. It's, uh, she hasn't really done much uh, particularly special, or other than kind of shitting on Ross during the uh, what was the the Fortune Street game. She came into her own in that one. Yeah, she hasn't done terribly much that makes her stick in my memory yet, so I guess we'll see what happens as she continues to grump. I think the the big thing that defined her was uh, her little one-liners in the Christmas merchandise videos. Too bad. You're getting one! I've heard it suggested, and I would kind of like to see them do it, that they make like a web sitcom of all five of them as roommates. But it's always just footage of games. You just hear the sitcom. Yes. 
That that's pretty much that's pretty much steamrolled. Pretty much, yeah. So I would say, um, during the uh, Fortune Street one again, she she was very much sort of a passive aggressive bad winner, or passive aggressive gloater, I guess. I don't really, I don't really remember that. All I know about the Fortune Street series is it made me want to get Fortune Street. Yeah, it's surprisingly fun looking for a game that's basically Monopoly with Mario and Dragon Quest. You will kill yourselves from how good this the AI is in that game, though. Is it as bad as Luigi in Mario Party? Yeah, it's pretty bad. And I'm usually Luigi, but usually it's Toad for me in Mario Party that's just like, you know, I want to kill his face. Oh, I will. Uh, basically, what we did back in, um, uh, kind of with a Christmas game, actually, we'd play Mario Party, either the original or Mario Party 4. Uh, but there's only ever three of us ever playing, me, Dave, and probably Alex, I think, my, my little brother. And um, we'd always set Luigi as the AI, and he'd always lose most of the minigames, but still just win at the end, just because that's the rule of it. So then we'd just boot up Smash Brothers, set him as the one-man team against us, and beat the living hell out of him. It felt very good. Uh, to kind of bring the topic back to Christmas... Uh topic I just thought about. Oh, yeah. This is the Christmas one. Staying on topic, what's that? Smash Brothers was a Christmas game. The original. For me. <laughs> uh, what I was going to say was, um, what are, as far as, like, Christmas special goes, like the Rankin Bass uh, cartoons or the stop motions, what are your guys' favorite or least favorite uh, movies or specials that come on at this time of year? A uh, Christmas Story. You know how uh, that one network, TBS, plays that for like 24 hours? Yeah. When I was growing up, that was on every TV in the house the day that happened. So that's just kind of a, a staple of Christmas for me, is just watching A Christmas Story as many times as you can handle. Yeah, we'd always go to my grandmother's for Christmas and... Christmas Story would be on at least one of her TVs for the entire day. And then there's uh, It's a Wonderful Life. I have to watch that at least three times. It just, you know, go into hysterics, because, you know, it's a great film. For me, it's mainly um, uh, The Muppets Christmas Carol. Yes! I, I grew up with that. I got it on video somewhere, I think. I might need to rebuy it on DVD, actually, but uh, we try to watch it every year. But, I don't know, That to me, that's just... Having Michael Caine as Scrooge is awesome, but also just... He plays it completely legit throughout the whole film. Like, he doesn't once ham it up or anything. So he's pretty much the anti-Tim Curry from up at Treasure Island. Pretty much. I mean, he's, uh... The the, um, the song he has when he's seeing his past self with his girlfriend at the time. That's really well done. Like, it, it's, uh... He's, got, he's better than that movie really needed, but it made the movie all the more better. Well, for me, the the favorite one would probably be either Christmas Story or Elf, and I would really like to get a Buddy the Elf costume together because I have Will Ferrell hair, but the different pieces cost too much. Um, but as for as for kind of bad or ridiculous ones, uh, have have any of you guys seen or heard of the just masterpiece of a film that is Rudolph and Frosty's Christmas in July? I have not. I can honestly say I've never heard it. No. <laughs> Same here, I don't know. Yeah, when I was in uh, high school, I did an article for our paper about just bad movies, so I went out looking for something terrible to do for Christmas, and I came across Rudolph and Frosty's Christmas in July, and it's it's exactly as good as it sounds. <laughs> there is an ice genie involved, and they take Frosty down to, like, Tennessee in July, because that sounds like a great idea, and... It's it's really just a great, great film altogether. As someone from Tennessee, yes, Tennessee in July is a terrible idea. I did forget one, actually. Uh, technically, Batman Returns is a Christmas film. Yes, yes it is, which is why I reviewed it in the middle of November. But yeah, I, I even though Batman Returns is riddled with problems, I do love that movie, and it is one that I always intend to watch at Christmas, but never do. Usually end up watching it in March. I, I think that just goes with the fact of our age and when it came out. You know, we were young then and so naive and said, Oh, that's Batman. That's really cool. 
Well, yeah, it is also just a very kind of... Like, if you pretend it's just Crazy Steve, it works. For those confused, Crazy Steve is the... I believe it's a Linkara reference. Yes, it's a Linkara's version of the Frank Miller Batman. Or interpretation, rather. He argues that's not Batman, it's a homeless guy called Crazy Steve who managed to wander into the Batcave and stole a bat suit. A Batcave. Exactly. I mean, it, it's one of those things where, looking at it objectively, you've got a movie where Batman is going around on Christmas beating up street-performing clowns. Well, Batman, the entire, like, series of him is basically this super-rich martial artist goes and beats up people who have a wide variety of psychological disorders and mental disabilities. Yeah, but he's not quite so public about it. Also, he tends to be a bit more... Uh, careful about who it is he's beating up most of the time. <laughs> he doesn't normally strap dynamite to a guy's chest and then throw him in a hole. Note the use of the word normally. Yeah, I took issue with that. I mean, it's one of those scenes where it's like, that is not Batman, but that is still awesome. Oh yeah, there's there's uh, three people he blatantly kills in that movie. Which is actually less overkill than the first movie, but it's less obvious. <laughs> In the first movie. I mean, he blows up a building in the first movie, but it's not really like he's maliciously just murdered someone by setting him on fire with his jet-powered car. Well, on the the action movie-related uh, topic, there is still the greatest Christmas movie of all time, which is, of course, Die Hard. <laughs> I still love that that's classified as a Christmas movie. <laughs> they play Let It Snow at the end. Believe it or not, I haven't even seen Die Hard to my recollection. Well, that's your Christmas mission. I was going to say gift, but I'm not buying it yet. Damn it. Plus it would be in Region 2 or whatever the hell this country is. I actually didn't see it till I was about 20, so it was kind of ruined for me because I can only see Alan Rickman as Professor Snape now. I'm 30, I still can't figure out my excuse. I have a history with movies that I probably watched them when I was a kid on late night television while trying to sleep, and as such can't really remember them that well. I have that problem with the whole Alien trilogy, except Aliens 3. Alien 3, rather. I'm like that with uh, TV shows. I started watching uh, Black Books very recently, and I got to the uh, the Grapes of Wrath episode and realized I watched that before, like when I was a kid. Yeah, it's funny how that uh, works out sometimes. Speaking of um, TV specials as well, uh, the uh, Blackadder Christmas special will always be uh, one of the best. That's where he uh, sort of does a reverse Mr. Scrooge, right? He starts off really nice and decides to be mean. Yeah, the joke is that Blackadder is a complete asshole throughout almost every incarnation, except this particular Scrooge version, where he's actually the nicest man in the universe. And then the Ghost of Christmas Future shows that if he's actually a, an asshole in throughout his life, his future self will have fantastic prosperity. So he decides to be an asshole, and it ruins his life. The Ghost didn't mean for that to happen, mind. It just sort of accidentally worked out that way. Yeah, the the, the Queen comes over, and <laughs> he's an asshole to her. <laughs> yeah. Has one of my favourite moments where... Uh, he's reaching into a stocking for Baldrick's present, and he's just, Baldrick, I got you a fist. Just punches him in the face. The best part about it is, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Just repeatedly punches him in the face. Ah, uh, poor Baldrick. <laughs> Wouldn't work without him. There's also, um, we have, I don't know how international they are, but, um, uh, do you have the snowman in America? Uh, the animated, uh, short. I've seen it once or twice, but I don't think it's played regularly here. Yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, it's a classic cartoon over here. Um, uh, you have... A, uh, it, it's, it gave us... The song Walking in the Air is from it. Um, but the, that, the animation guys behind that also did one called uh, Merry Bloomin' Christmas, which is all about... Uh, over here called Father Christmas, where he's basically just living an ordinary life in some London suburb and eventually Christmas rolls around and he has to do his thing but before that he goes on holiday for the rest of the year and you see his sort of what he does in between Christmases before you see what he does at Christmas it's treated in a very British manner though as in he's not 
depicted as being particularly uh, related to the North Pole. Uh, have you guys all seen uh, Tom Hanks' Polar Express? I saw like half of it, and I was... I don't know if it's just me, but the little kid's singing was too professional. It really creeped me out a bit. Well, it creeps me out whenever I watch it is because I think you know motion capture wasn't a really perfected technology, and my old roommate and I were watching this, and we are like, everyone in this movie just looks pissed off all the time. I do remember one kid had uh, Mandoc's voice from Dexter's Lab. And it was just really weird hearing that voice from a realistically designed character who was also a child. <laughs> I half expected that. It was just sort of... Why? It'd, like, it'd be like hearing Ren Hoek's voice from a real person. I've never watched Polar Express like all the way through. I've seen some of the beginning, some of the end, some of the middle. But I've never really sat down and watched the whole thing. It was my favorite storybook, though. Was it a book first? Yeah, it's a ch- children's storybook, yeah. It's been around for, like, at least well, at least my entire life. I don't know exactly when it was published, but it's a couple decades old. I never saw it. Tim, that's why you're fired. <laughs> I guess this time the uh, redundancy package is just a lump of coal just for the season. <laughs> Has anybody else seen the, uh, the motion-captured uh, night- or Christmas Carol with uh, Jim Carrey? I saw this chase scene between like him and I guess the Ghost of Christmas Future, and I I kind of went walked away because I thought it was too cartoony. I saw I saw the trailers and I didn't think it'd be much. I don't think I realized it was Jim Carrey though. Not until later, anyway. If you can't watch that movie all the way through, you have to watch the scene where the Ghost of Christmas Present uh, fades away. It is the creepiest scene I've ever witnessed. I've just never watched any movie that's disturbed me that much. Yeah, because it's like I've I saw that uh, when Nostalgia Critic talked about it, and he like he's laughing and jolly, and then he just kind of like falls and decomposes to a skeleton, but the skeleton's still laughing. It's pure nightmare fuel. <laughs> is he becoming the ghost of Christmas Future, or is it just how he departs? He just dies, just right there. He turns to ash and just blows away. Tempted to watch it just for that. Do they have any other mind fuckery in the movie, or is it just that one bit? There's there's a few more scenes here and there, but that's definitely the the pinnacle of creepy in that movie. I'll have to give it a try. Um, I did think of another one actually. Uh, the the Santa Claus movie, I think it's called, not the Santa Claus with um, what's his face, but the '80s one with the guy from Third Rock from the Sun with the as the villain. As the one where the villain. Um... He's got the for free line. I think so. It's the one where um, they had the whole origin story of Santa Claus. I uh, I have vague memories of that. Yeah, it's just that that start of it is really well done. It's like the start of Superman uh, one on Krypton. It's surprisingly high concept and that executed really well. Not what you expect from Christmas movies. Not these days, anyway. I don't feel like I saw it. Did, uh, did the Nostalgia Critic review that one? I think he did. Um, I used to watch it when I was a kid a lot. and but So I, my main memories are from that. But uh, yeah, I think Nostalgia Critic reviewed it. He was certain that the, that version of uh, Santa Claus was listed among his top 10. Or top 12, rather. Okay, because I do know I've heard of, uh, I've heard of it. And I know of it. But I just don't know how. And I'm fairly certain it was through, uh, through that. Yeah, they'd show it on TV when I was a kid, so I'd watch it uh, around Christmas at that time. I remember another epi- another movie coming on like immediately after once, and it was about a kid waking up to Santa being there and seeing Rudolph out the window. But that's all I really remember. I don't remember it being as good. Now, have you all seen the what's sure to be a Christmas classic starring Vince Vaughn, Fred Claus? It was on TV the other day. I saw some of it. I stopped watching. I have not watched it. I I don't even know. I don't like Vince Vaughn. Well, I mean it it was just it was Vince Vaughn playing this character who's an asshole who through the course of the movie realizes he needs to not be an asshole anymore. It's a Vince Vaughn movie. Yeah, basically I go on AMDB <laughs> and just cover my eyes and point and you've just descri- <laughs> described the plot of that movie. There's just more snow in it this time. And little people. 
Although he's fairly tall, so at least he looks it in films. What slew me in the beginning was they're talking about it. the entire premise of the movie is that um, because Santa was Saint Nicholas and he was made a saint, him and his family are immortal. And I thought that's it's a really neat trick considering one of the things you have to do to be a candidate for sainthood is perform. I believe you have to have at least one or two miracles attributed to you posthumously. Not that I expect the writers of a Vince Vaughn movie to research the qualifications for sainthood. Well, he was declared a saint uh, outside of the movie, as Saint Nicholas did actually exist, from what I understand. Um, and from Turkey, if I remember right. Well, he was sainted, but just part of being a saint is it can't happen until after you're long dead. Ah, I see. Right. So he's dead. He's a zombie Santa. Or, or ghost Santa. Or cyborg Santa? Cyborg ghost zombie Santa. Not Cyberman Santa. He's a Time Lord. This is going to be weird to anyone listening. Also, who's doing that? I've got a 10th Doctor Sonic Screwdriver, and I think Tim has the other ones. I have the uh, the 11th Doctor Sonic... The interchangeable Sonic Screwdriver. I have a screwdriver. <laughs> It doesn't make much sound. I found a Tom Baker era um, Sonic Screwdriver toy because I guess they're remaking those now around the fiftieth, but it was forty bucks. Ouch. Yeah, the uh, the interchangeable one I got was about forty bucks. Maybe it's because I'm more of a Star Wars fan than I was ever a Doctor Who fan, but I've never even thought to spend that much on a lightsaber toy, even though that's what I'd want more. I got this as a prop. It's basically an expense for a video because I'm going to be using it in uh, something that's upcoming. I don't think I could find a use for a lightsaber in our reviews, although I probably imagine Dave could. Well, there's two of you. I'm sure there are points of contention every now and again. And there you go. You're welcome. That is sort of the point of the reviews. It's I'm the positive one, he's the negative one. But it never really ends in any sort of fisticuffs. It should. It should have after I was shown talk. I mean, we agreed that it was horrible, but he still made me watch it. <laughs> Unforgivable. Admittedly, that's not the worst movie we've seen. What would you qualify as the worst? Miami Vice, probably. I think I hate that one more than Transformers 2. That's a hefty claim right there. I know, it's just... I can think of things I like about Transformers 2, and I can't about Miami Vice. Except maybe Gong Lee. But that's not really... You know, that's just the movie paying someone to be there, really. Also, it's a case of, I like these people in other movies. Well, not so much uh, Colin Farrell, but, you know, I like Jamie Foxx in other movies. That brings up an interesting question. Why is Colin... Why, or was, actually. Why was Colin Farrell so famous? Like, what happened there? I'm not sure. Um, there, there are some actors who I just can't figure out why they're so prevalent. Um, either because they just say yes to a paycheck any time, or maybe they're just viewed as uh, particularly attractive actors to have in their roles or something. Yeah, that guy just came out of nowhere. It's like, uh, and who are you? He just always looks a bit out of place whenever he's in something. I can't think of a movie I've uh, liked him in as such. I did watch SWAT recently, and he wasn't bad in it, but... It, he wasn't special either, especially considering he was alongside Samuel Jackson as well, so... I'm trying to remember if I ever watched a film with him in, and I don't think I ever have. He was in an episode of Scrubs once, I think. I may have seen that, depending on the season it was in. Yeah, it was one, I think he uh, brought someone into the hospital. All of the women were completely adoring him, and then JD and Turk had to... Uh, get him arrested because he's the person that put the other guy in hospital in the first place. But they're friends as well, because they're Irish. Scrubs was weird at times. But when it was weird, it was great. I think that was my favorite part about that show. It's one of those shows that um, I think I just watched too much of in the end of it, because they just kept showing it on the various channels we have, uh, various versions of Channel 4 and whatnot that just wouldn't relent on putting scrubs on for so much. 
Yeah, Comedy Central used to have just massive Scrubs marathons. And the thing is, I ended up not liking JD at all. I think uh, I think the thing with JD was, like, they were going to stick with his character the way his character was come hell or high water. And that made it so a lot of the times he was really unlikable. Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of episodes where it felt like they were just drawing something out. Like, um, he spent ages trying to get Elliot to be with him. And then they have that moment at the end of the episode where he realizes he doesn't love her once he finally gets with her. And it's like, are you serious? You spend all this time doing this and it's like, oh shit, we've still got half a season to go. Yeah, by the end I pretty much watched that show for Dr. Cox and the Janitor. My favorite's Kelso. Uh, yeah, probably late Kelso. Early Kelso was a huge bastard, but eventually they're just like, we gotta lighten this guy up, so just have him pop in, say something hilarious, and then leave. Well, no, they, um, relatively early on, like in like the third or fourth season, I guess it's halfway through, actually, but, um, they did start making him seem more like he was a necessary evil in the hospital. Like, yeah, he was a complete bastard, but they had to actually, you know, without him there, a lot of what they do doesn't get done. Yeah, like the the episode where he straight up acknowledges that he knows what Dr. Cox does with uh, deceased patients with good insurance and people that are alive that don't have good insurance whenever his friend needs a procedure or something. That he just kind of turns his, but he like looks away whenever they do that. And that's a big part of the story arc when Doctor Cox becomes chief of medicine, is he realizes, oh shit, I kind of have to do all this stuff I hated about when Kelso was here. There's also the one where um, he kind of realizes that the only way the hospital sort of runs is there's so many people there that hate each other. At the end of the day, <laughs> that they need someone much more vile than them to hate un- in unison. There's also the one where he had to make a horrible decision uh, that ultimately ended up with someone dying, I think. Uh, and as he's just leaving the hospital... Earlier they show him leaving the hospital after making a decision and he's just whistling and happy. And they show that again and he's leaving it and he's just clearly mortified. Then when he notices someone turning up he just starts whistling and walks off happily. Man, I, I think I only watched up to like season six. I don't remember any of this stuff. That show gets dark as hell. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of why I like Dr. Kelso more than most of the others. It's just this kind of... He's willing to be this hated figure because he knows he's doing the right thing at the end of the day. Even though he does a lot of genuinely awful things throughout his life aside from that. Like cheating on his wife all the time with prostitutes. <laughs> Jeez. So that said, I think that's kind of in, in keeping with the whole... I like him because he's not a good guy, but he kind of is at times as well. Like He's not completely evil, but he's nowhere near good either. <laughs> I actually wanted to say, actually, uh, you brought up Elf earlier, uh, the Will Ferrell one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, we actually intended to... Because every now and then we think, oh, something certain holiday is coming up, so we should review something for it, and we just end up giving up on it. But um, we were going to review Elf, uh, as neither of us has seen it, and we just figured most Christmas movies these days were terrible, so let's just watch one. And I have to admit, it ended up being one of my favorite Christmas movies. It's just a lot of fun. And honestly, I think a lot of that does come from Will Ferrell. He's just very good at being, you know, very good at being an overgrown man-child, as his entire acting career shows. I think it's just a very good movie overall as well. Like, there's nothing bad about anyone in the in the movie itself, from what I remember. Uh, it's John Favreau, isn't it, the director? Iron Man guy. I believe so. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it shows he can make a good Christmas movie as well as a good superhero, well, a, a good Tony Stark movie. I wanted to say good superhero movie, but he doesn't really do many superheroics in the first two movies, other than fight some people. Eh, it counts. Yeah. I, I heard a lot of complaining about how little you actually see Iron Man in Iron Man 3, but when you think about it, it also had more action than the first two combined probably did. He actually, they actually advertise the fact that he saves a bunch of people rather than blows up a tank as well. Though that would be a bit weird in context, if he just, oh, lots of people falling from a plane, I'll just blow up this tank. And Iron Man 3 is supposed to be a Christmas movie as well. That is true. Although, doesn't it start way ahead of Christmas? It might. I just remember the giant bunny was like a Christmas present to Pepper, as well as like blowing up all of his suits. 
which might make I, uh, the Avengers too awkward. I see. I wasn't sure if he blew up all his suits or just like the Mark Eight through Forty Two that he had made while he was in kind of his panic mode. I guess there's always the Iron Patriot, which is apparently supposed to be in Iron Man Two, from what I last heard. Uh, Avengers Two, rather. Yeah, there was a tie-in comic with with the Avengers where basically um, War Machine shows up right after the entire thing's over. <laughs> uh, there was actually I, I thought they were originally going to have um, Rhodey as Iron Man in the in the first Avengers movie, just because they established that Tony Stark wasn't fit for purpose. And seeing as the comics actually had that happen where Tony Stark wasn't Iron Man for a while and it's a big secret who he was. And it turned out to be Rhodey. They could always go the route where, you know, Captain America becomes disenfranchised with the US government and he becomes nomad and no one can figure out who this new superhero who throws around shield is. <laughs> that was a really dumb era of the Captain America comics. He's had a few. I always find it funny how they try to well, I, I get. I actually like that they'd have Captain America turn against the government as a kind of principles thing, because it'd be like Superman opposing Lex Luthor as president kind of situation. But it, it kind of gets a bit silly when it's happened quite a few times now. Yeah, I mean the the thing about Captain America is he's supposed to he wants to represent what he feels is American ideals, not necessarily the current U.S. government. But yeah, the the whole Captain America, you know, going renegade thing, and really the whole heroes fighting heroes thing in general is something that I think's just been really overdone lately. I'm pretty sick of it myself, to be honest. Um, they had it with the... Uh, I read Civil War, and I just hated the ending to that one. But it seems like they're doing it every year. Like, they just had Avengers vs. X-Men. Uh, what was it they had the year before that? I don't remember. Um, they had... Blackest Night at one point, which technically had all the heroes who had died come back as Black Lanterns, but that was... That actually wasn't bad, as far as the story went. I kind of saw that as DC's attempt at Marvel Zombies. Okay, I think I, I think we have an opportunity here to pull this back onto track. Um, Christmas. <laughs> are there any games that you guys are playing uh, specifically over the Christmas season right now? Um, my girlfriend... Uh, texted and basically straight up said, do you have Arkham Asylum and Arkham City? And I said no, and she said, act surprise at Christmas, so I'll be playing those. I've been trying to work through... Uh, well, I keep forgetting to play it, because I find other distractions, but uh, I decided to start playing Shenmue again this year, which is set at Christmas, or at least it eventually goes over Christmas, but uh, in 1986, which is the year I was born. So, there's that. I also got it for Christmas in... 2000, so it's kind of my Christmas game every year. Zilla, any games you're playing uh, over this holiday season? Well, at the current moment, me and my friend are playing the new uh, Super Mario 3D World. While he's home for Christmas, he goes to college in Florida, and we've been playing the hell out of that, and it's gotten to a point where it's really hard. <laughs> really? I really want that game. The difficulty spike gets pretty intense after you beat the main game, and there's the, the post-game afterwards. The secret levels can get pretty tricky. Oh yeah, that's kind of tradition, though. I've always liked that about Mario, how you can just go through the main game and it's pretty easy, but if you want to go beyond that, it's like, yep, you better know what you're doing, otherwise we're going to kick your ass. Those smiling clouds are a lie. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a game uh, that I'm... I'm going to be trying to get a classic controller for my Wii, because I just bought a second Wii. So, as I told you guys before, I can actually play Metroid Other M again, which I'll be playing that. But more importantly, I'll be getting Super Metroid on the Virtual Console and playing that again. I am so fucking excited. I love that game so much. I'm planning to play um, uh, Animal Crossing for the 3DS as well uh, for Christmas, just because I keep missing Animal Crossing Christmases pretty much since the first Christmas <laughs> with Animal Crossing back on the GameCube, so I'm, I'm going to try and catch that one this year. I know I could just change the clock, but that's hardly in keeping with the spirit. So I'm guessing there's an event that happens in the game over Christmas? Yeah, it's called Christmas. <laughs> oh, I figured that! Go on! <laughs> yeah, do elaborate on this Christmas that you're, you speak of. Well, what you do is you dress up in red 
and you go into people's houses and you shake all their stuff until money falls out and then leave. Or is that Zelda? I forget. No, no, that, that sounds like a very Christmassy thing that most people would do. I'll do that in Zelda if I can't in Animal Crossing. I can wear red in Ocarina of Time at least. Actually, now that you mentioned Christmas-themed events, I play Lord of the Rings Online on occasion, and I know they have a Yule Festival around this time with some uh, some special items and some free leveling, basically, so I might hop on that for a little bit. That was actually a thing. Um, uh, this is the second year without Christmas for City of Heroes, and what they'd do every, every year would be... Uh, They'd have the big winter event where there'd be snowman and presents everywhere. You'd have to kill the snowman and hope the presents don't lead to more snowmen. But the uh, they'd also have the Christmas event uh, chalet, which in a pocket dimension you could visit this giant wooden chalet with a fire in the middle and a bar where everyone would just hang out and you could go skiing down the snow or take on missions where you fight evil gnomes or elves, I, I guess. They, 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 don't, they don't really look like either. I'm guessing I'm the only one that played City of Heroes at Christmas. I played it for a little bit. I played uh, Champions Online for a while, but I don't think around Christmas time. I don't like Champions, to be honest. It's not as... Uh, I don't know, the gameplay just doesn't feel right. It's certainly not as good anymore. Um, I believe they've been bought by a new company, and there have been a lot of changes. A lot of the customization options have been taken away or put as things you have to pay for. and It's... It really isn't as good as it used to be now. Yeah, I noticed that. I, I tried to play it recently, um, and just noticed I couldn't make anything. So I just sort of gave up on it. I I don't think they were bought by a different company or, as such, because they've been owned by Perfect World for a while. But I don't know, maybe something did happen. Um, kind of feel sorry for Cryptic, though. They just can't seem to make a winner these days. They made City of Heroes, then... NCSoft bought them, and most of the team that made it, and now since then they've made Star Trek Online, uh, Champions Online, and now Neverwinter. And I can't say I care for any of them, really. Are you guys aware of uh, what the Yule Log is on TV? Is that the uh, constantly burning fireplace? Yeah, it's just where one station devotes 24 hours to showing a stationary picture of a burning log. So you can emulate having a fireplace in your house. I have a fireplace in my house. Bastard. That means I can have two! <laughs> <coughs> nice. That's twice the holiday spirit. But only half the warmth. And only half the cost of coal. Well, actually, the full cost of coal. So if you're a bad boy all year and Santa brings you coal, you're ecstatic. Cause you're like, oh good, I get to be warm tonight. Maybe when March rolls around. British weather tends to be mild in winter. Sometimes we get snow at Christmas, but only like a light sprinkling. The past few years have had some pretty good uh, snowstorms, uh, like before and after Christmas, but it just seems like it heats up for that one day. Here in the Midwest, we've been just getting really warm for the season, then it just, the temperature just plummets and we get snowstorms and... Right now it's in one of its really warm phases, so all the snow from the last storm is melting, and it's just been kind of screwy the past couple of years. I myself really enjoy snow, and, you know, we usually, we would usually get it, but these last couple of years we've been having, like, spring and summer days in the middle of the winter. I, uh, I really miss those days of, like, nor'easters that would just cover everything in snow, like two feet. Ugh. Those were the days. I blame Al Gore. <laughs> That was actually kind of rare in Britain for a good many years until recently. Like, the past few years we've had some proper thick snows. Uh, and I, I'm one that enjoys snow as well. I, I kind of get fed up with people complaining about it. But, um... The, I kind of miss the days when I was a kid and you could have snowball fights and no one would think you're being violent. Well, a lot of years growing up near Chicago, it would get so cold that it wouldn't be snow anymore. It would basically just rain ice. Um, so what would happen would be you might have some snow on the ground and then with a sheet of ice over it. So any time you try to like throw a snowball, you're really just throwing a jagged piece of ice at each other. You mean that's not how it's supposed to be? From what I'm told, no. Uh, are you also not supposed to put that customary stone inside? <laughs> no, no, what, 
What we do is you make some snowballs beforehand and you put them in your freezer overnight so they turn into ice balls. Uh, we would usually do it at school where we're far away from the, uh, a freezer. So stones are the way to do it. Or bricks. <laughs> Sometimes we just throw the bricks without the snow. I was about to say, I'm imagining a brick <laughs> covered in snow and it's not exactly a, a stealthy maneuver. I do remember one year uh, we had a snowball fight in the, in the uh, uh, schoolyard. This is like when I was... Uh, 14 maybe and we just just this huge snowball fight happening and um, the one teacher was trying to stop it happening but this is like every school year just uh, in complete war with each other with snow and it, she was completely usurped when the art teacher the, the graphic design teacher and the PE teacher all joined in the snowball fight and then she just got pummeled with snowballs so the last time I really did Anything out in the snow was probably like five or six years ago. Me and my friend Austin were, he was spending the night at my house for New Year's and there was a snowstorm over the night and we decided we were going to go out at like two in the morning and try to make uh, one of those Easter Island statues and we ended up just making the derpiest face that either of us had either seen, but it was like six feet high on my front lawn so it was there for the next month. Did you spray it with uh, a bit of water to freeze over? We did, actually. I, I am hoping you have pics of this. Uh, I might have at one point, but they'd be long lost now. Did you stand next to it dressed as the Megazord? This was a couple years before the Megazord, sadly. And the Megazord costume did not survive winter weather very well. It would have made a good villain. The derpy face, that is. Sadly, the stars did not align on that particular dream. The, uh, the last thing I did with snow was uh, get whiplash as I slipped on the ice on a hill while going up. Welcome to adulthood. I don't know if it's usual procedure, but the doctor recommended I just sleep sitting up for three weeks. That seems odd. <laughs> it worked, at least. Uh, basically what would happen was I'd try to sleep regularly and uh, I'd just be paralyzed with pain. That was March, though. So not really Christmassy. Speaking of games, though, it, it, I remember um, back on the Dreamcast they'd do something with Sonic Adventure at Christmas where they'd release uh, a patch online because the Dreamcast let you do that back then. Uh, and they put a Christmas tree in the main square of uh, the central hub with, uh, what was it called now? Uh, the song from uh, Nights Into Dreams. I, Dream Dreams, I think it's called. The a cappella version would play whenever you got near it. Which is something I don't... I kind of wonder why games don't do more now that they're all just online all the time. Well, they might, but you have to pay the, you know, $4 DLC package for it. Or you have to have a gold membership. Yeah, I forgot Sega did this stuff for free back then. FREE?! FOR FREE?! The first game they released on the, uh, Dreamcast that had online play, Choo Choo Rocket, if you ordered it via their online site Dream Arena or Dream Keep I think it was Dream Arena you would get it for free and it was a great game as well this like sort of competitive puzzle game that's just crazy talk it's probably why Sega don't make consoles anymore among other things like the PlayStation 2 and Shenmue costing about 8 million to make they weren't really masters of business I will admit admittedly I never owned a Sega what? Explain yourself right now. We had a store in my town called uh, Replay. I believe it's still there, but it's moved locations. But it was our local, privately owned game place. And basically we just went there one day and my dad was like, well, we're, we're going to get a video game system. And he, there was a Super Nintendo and like a Sega Genesis because we knew absolutely nothing about the difference. And he said, which one do you like? And... I liked the grey and purple one better, so we got that, and we had Nintendo consoles ever since. You missed out on classics like Toe Jam and Earl. <laughs> and actually, um, when I saw Game Grumps put up their Mickey Mania episode, I did a double take because I suddenly remembered that's the first game we ever owned. Thinking of that, actually, um, like I said earlier, the Master System was my first game, uh, games console, and Sonic 1 it. Uh, was my first game. I was playing um, Megabyte Punch, uh, a recently released Smash Brothers-esque style brawler, uh, where you play as a little robot that you can customize. 
but the first level of it, it just reminds me so much of the 8-bit Green Hill. Like just the sort of pixelation and the color tones and everything. It's quite nostalgic for some reason. I've never seen the uh, the Sonic the Hedge <coughs> Sonic the Hedgehog on the Master System, though I've never played a Master System either. And I've just really, 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 really wanted been wanting to find one. It's very different. Um, it's the first level, um, the, uh, Green Hill Act One. Uh, you, I can complete in about twenty six seconds. You're not supposed to be able to complete it that quickly, I don't think. But you can sort of just... When you get a, um invincibility and roll down a hill, uh, there's a, like a particular hill you roll off it and launch off screen. And if you just keep holding forward and tap jump every now and then, you'll just sort of reach the end without before the screen catches up to you. It wasn't um as well designed as Sonic... as the Mega Drive games either, like the level design, because it, it, I don't think they could do as much uh, with the physics, but... It's, it's got a more traditional platformer feel to it. But I still love it quite a lot. It's one of, one of my favourite games, even with its flaws. It's got some great music as well. Its version of the Labyrinth, uh, Labyrinth Zone is very jazzy. Again, with gaming and Christmas at least, uh, Ocarina of Time was a Christmas game for me. I think I spent the majority of Christmas morning just running around Kokiriko Forest, just try Kokiri Forest rather, trying to find the fucking sword. Ugh, I have such the most unpopular opinion in that game. I do not like Ocarina of Time. That seems to be more common these days. It just takes so long to get started, and then it feels so small in scale, you know? Like, yeah, I get, it's like 3D, so they couldn't really do as much as they did with A Link to the Past, but it's just it just feels so small and didn't really grab me. I think at the same time they could also do more in terms of cinematics, so that would, it, so they tried to pace it a bit more um, story-wise in the beginning. I actually played Majora's Mask before I played Ocarina of Time, and Ocarina of Time did feel like a very substantial downgrade. Which is how you'd want it to be, really. Oh yeah. I really, 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 really want to play Majora's Mask. Like you have no idea. That might be that might be another game I get on the virtual console, depending on how much it costs. I own it about two times, I think. I got it on the uh, I got the N sixty four version, and I got the special GameCube that came with Mario Kart and the Zelda collection. But um, yeah, Ocarina of Time though, like this was uh, not long after it came out in nineteen ninety eight, seeing as it well Christmas. But um, that was just a really big deal at the time. I was I remember seeing the adverts for it and getting really excited. And then suddenly I got the game and it's just running around this uh, world trying to find a damn sword. Going through the in that little tunnel. Turning to my left and seeing this giant boulder coming at me and just leaving and ignoring it for the rest of the night. Until about uh, the afternoon after uh, breakfast and lunch or whatever when I decided to go back and find the sword. When I first played Ocarina of Time, I rented it from our from our family video, and um, I thought that the entire game was just going to be the finding the three stones. I had no idea that there was going to be a, a vastly bigger game after that. Um, so I basically found all three, but didn't get back to Hyrule before I had to return the game, and... Um, I was looking at it the next time we went to Family Video, and I was like, "Oh, well, I played most of that game, so I don't, I don't need to get it again." And then later, I found that there was this much more epic quest after you actually do that, and was sad about my life choices. <laughs> I remember uh, actually in the in the lead up to it, like um, I think between the uh, when I got the Nintendo sixty four, that was when I started to really get into. Uh, gaming magazines and news and so on and trying to keep up with what was coming out and Zelda was on the horizon in uh, 1996 and 1997 and I remember hearing that there was going to be this uh, like a training area in the game where you can just practice sword play and just that excited me this idea that you could just play a, uh, play around with the sword and just attack things and have fun with that doesn't quite work out that way when you get the game but in my head it was oh I could just choose sword play mode and have fun with that I had a similar experience with uh, Mario 64, actually, when, when I first got the Nintendo 64. Um, the first hour I played of that, I didn't realise one of the doors was, unlock was already unlocked. 
So I didn't just immediately go for the bomb battlefield. I just ran around the uh, castle gardens for ages, having fun with the controls. And I didn't get bored. That was the weird thing, like, just playing that game was a lot of fun. That really is a game where, like, you can do a bunch of stuff and go through levels, and then just, you start doing something in between levels, like you do the triple jump, and then you just can't stop doing that because it just looks so good and feels so good. Yeah, or when you figure out you can, like, uh, do the long jump, and then you try using it with a kick instead, and you do this sort of flying kick off a bridge. Or like an ocarina. Or was I the only one to find that out? Apparently so. Seems that way. It wasn't in the manual, which I remember. Um, when you did, when you were running forward and pressed the Z button, you'd duck and do a slide. If you haven't played Mario 64, that is to the audience. Uh, and then pressed jump, you'd do a long jump, which allowed you to reach further distances. Uh, but if you pressed uh, kick the the punch button instead, you'd do a sort of short kick, which uh, wasn't in the manual because I'm guessing it was completely useless. But it looked cool when you did it off a bridge into the lake. That was actually something I was thinking about recently. Um, when I was a kid, I really liked that Mario could punch and kick for some reason, because I've always liked brawlers and fighting games and whatnot. And then you got to Mario Sunshine where he couldn't do it at all, and I felt disappointed. And thought back and realized I never needed to punch anything in Mario 64, except maybe a box. Like, maybe the, the blocks that are in your way or something, but you could just ground pound those as well. Super Mario 64 just had a lot of a lot of things going on with it, and that's what I like about games. Uh, certain games, it's like, well, you have all of these different things that you can do, and you're probably going to figure them out during normal play, but you don't really need to know how to do them. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of why I'm, I really hate tutorials in games. I'd rather just figure out how to play it myself, unless it's an obviously, like, this game has so many systems you need a tutorial to figure it out. But I get sick of the tutorials in Assassin's Creed every single time or in a first person shooter. I quite like that uh, Far Cry th uh, 3 Blood Dragon takes the piss out of them. But you still have to go through it at the same time. I was actually going to say, and if the Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon doesn't make you think of Christmas, I don't know what will. We've been going on for uh, quite some time now and I... I think it's about time that we wrap this podcast up, so I'm going to let Tim uh, finish what he was going to say, and then we're going to go around with final comments. Uh, that's just why I find it so funny about uh, Ego Raptor never knowing what to do with games whenever he just flies past tutorials. But then you realize the reason why he does that is he doesn't believe that games should have to show tutorials to teach you how to play. They should teach you through their game design, which I agree with wholeheartedly. So, yeah, that's it. Make a band, make a band. Shut your mouth! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so does anyone have any final comments before we wrap this podcast up? Uh, I hope you enjoy your your ham or turkey or veggie plate or whatever it is that you're going to be having this holiday season and that you have it with your family or if you don't like your family, somebody you like and uh, enjoy your holiday season. Pretty much the same here. Uh, have a good holiday and play video games, watch movies, and have fun, and forget that you have to work in a week's time. I have to work tomorrow, so... Forget that you have to work in a week's time as well. I am mainly speaking for myself. Yeah, not much more to say. Everybody, have fun, enjoy the holidays, enjoy the new year, be safe traveling, all that stuff. And watch Santa Claus the movie, it is very good. Not the Tim Allen one. That one's okay, I guess. I'm going to watch that one. Not as good. You you go ahead and do whatever you want, buddy, but uh, <laughs> results may vary. <laughs> and we all hope that you enjoy whatever holiday specials you decide to put on as well. So from all of us here at Geeks the Roundtable, have a happy holidays and a happy new year. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Oh, yeah, and watch, uh, watch Scrooge starring Bill Murray. And the San... No and other stuff that are Christmas themed and Die Hard <laughs> and Batman Returns though don't expect it to be a good Batman movie and don't watch Die Hard 2 but do watch Die Hard 3 I think we're done <laughs>